Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very excited for this one. Um, I'm speaking with Clive Young about his book from Lewith Press, published in 2023, titled Unlocking Scots, The Secret Life of the Scots Language, which pretty much does what it says on the tin, um, looks to uncover the secret life of Scots, the language, um, both what's happened historically, the centuries of debate, um, the centuries of all sorts of things happening to the language, all the way really up to the present. Um, So this book packs quite a lot in to the discussion of the Scots language. Clive, thank you so much for being with us to tell us all about it. Oh, thanks very much for inviting me. That's a, that's a real treat. Um, yeah, so Unlocking Scots, uh, yeah, it came out this summer, I think it was June, and I was trying to capture the uh, the discussion, which has kind of spanned centuries, really, on the nature and history of the Scots language, uh, its place in society, and really, towards the end of the book, a little bit about its future. You know, what can we what can we do about it? Um so, uh, so, 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 I suppose like, what, what, why, why do you write this book anyway? Um, so, I mean, I, as you probably tell from uh, from my accent, I, I'm Scottish. I was uh, born and educated uh, in Scotland, and uh, when I was young, when I was a, when I was a child, I was a bairn in Scot. I, I learned Scots in uh, um, um, East Central Scotland, um, East Lothian, Fife, and Perthshire. If people know Scotland at all. Um, I'm a, I, I'm now re- retired, but I was a biologist by training. But uh, I, I worked as a uh, an educational consultant, you know, in, in universities on, on both sides of the border. I'm now living in London, but looking forward to going back to, to Scotland uh, in Glasgow next uh, next year. So the, the kind of, I've had a long interest in, in languages and particularly languages in, in, in society and how they work in society. And I think that was maybe partly due to that bilingual, being brought up bilingually between Scots and, 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 and Scottish English. Um, but also I had um, a kind of connection, a long connection with uh, Catalonia and Spain, um, uh, where the, you know, the language uh, uh, questions were quite quite prominent. Um, and I became kind of fascinated by the politics of language um, and eventually went back to study a little bit more about language and more depth, study English and so on. But the real reason why why, why this book is uh, was written really, and it's, it's good. I've been writing it about ten years really, was that the linguistic situation in, in, in Scotland is it's kind of complicated with Scots, and quite controversial. Huh? So um, the um, the book was a kind of attempt to really attempt to capture this long debate and see what the various side were, were uh, what the various arguments are, and uh, and as I say, at the end of the day, what should we do about it? Uh, Scots as a a linguistic entity, uh, a, a part of our culture. What should we do about it? Thank you for taking us through that bit of background. Um, I think that's the helpful to know sort of how you came to the book um, before we sort of start talking about it in more detail. Is there anything before we kind of get into what's happened to Scots as a language? Do you want to tell us anything about the language itself? I think I think Scots, Scots is quite unusual. If you... If you um, uh, uh, Throughout the book, I, I call Scots a language, yeah, because that's essentially what it is. But there's a debate in Scotland about is it a dialect, is it just bad English, uh, and so on. And this is a debate that actually goes back uh, centuries. So what I kind of call, call Scots is the uh, is is almost a kind of literary literary language. So if you if you're in Scotland and you went back in time in a time machine about a hundred years, you know, early part of the twentieth century, you'd hear most people speaking Scots. So Scots would be a language which is very, very close to English, but noticeably different, a slightly different grammar, lots of different vocabulary, and so on and so on. And, um, at, you know, at that time, in the early 20th century, people were writing um, field studies of Scots and uh, grammars. There was already dictionaries. Um, and the early part of the 20th century, there was a kind of like a sort of second renaissance of Scots as a as a language. Scots always had a, a kind of a literary history, uh, you know, Robert Burns and Henry Dunbar. And all these, there's a lot of kind of uh, writers in there. And as I say, in the early uh, 20th century, um, through uh, Hugh McDermott and so on, there was another, uh, uh, what do you call a Scot- Scots renaissance. So at that time, Scots was quite clear. But what has happened over the last century, really, is Scots hasn't really been supported. We'll, we'll come to that in a little bit more detail, I'm sure, but it's not really been supported in you know in education or by the government or anything like that. And it's become much more when it's spoken now. It's spoken in a mix with with English or, or really the Scottish form of English, which is 
uh, Scottish English. So if you're in Scotland nowadays, you know, you go out to the streets of Scotland nowadays, you'll hear people speaking all sorts of kind of varieties of a mixture between uh, Scots and, 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 and Scottish English. And sometimes that's quite understandable if it's a mixture is quite English-like. If it's quite Scots-like, it might be less understandable if you don't know the linguistic uh, environment. And on top of that, there's also some dialectical uh, differences as well. If you went up to like Aberdeen or Shetland, you know, the kind of north, um, uh, you know, north northeast of Scotland, then you'd find people speaking another way. Again, it's still Scots, and they still use Scots English, but it's the, there's quite a strong dialectical um, 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 uh, part of that as well. So it's quite a complicated, it's quite a complicated linguistic uh, situation. And uh, the, the the way that people speak nowadays, I, I in the book I, I say it's a bit like if you've heard of Spanglish, you know that kind of mixture between Spanish and English, which is spoken in the North America along the you know um, um, uh, the Texan uh, Texas and Mexican border, and that's a, a language variety which is quite dynamic. It varies a lot up uh, 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 along that uh, border, uh, but it's neither English and it's not Spanish either. So I think what the people the vernacular Scots is is often that kind of mixture between them. It's it's really quite quite quite. Uh, Quite dynamic, and people people sort of like mix up in different ways. You know, if you're a uh, I, I, if you're a kind of skilled Scots speaker, you can use a lot of Scots. Um, if you're speaking in kind of formal um, environments, then you may use. I'm like most likely to use more English. If you're speaking with people you don't know, you'll use more English. Uh, if you're speaking about I don't know technical things or speaking in the university or whatever, you're going to use a lot more English. But in the kind of so Scots is more familiar in the kind of more familiar territory of the home, friends down the pub informal conversations, that sort of thing. So I think when you think about Scots, is on one side you've got this kind of literary heritage language and then you've got the kind of modern implementation of that, the way that people speak it on an everyday basis, where you have this strange, um, not really strange, it's quite exciting, uh, dynamic mixture between Scots and, and Scottish English. And, of course, in Scotland, a lot of people will just speak English. There are a Scottish version of English as well. So that's what I mean by it's quite complicated. And, and really why I was got around to writing the book was I had to try, I couldn't make any sense of it myself. So I thought if I sit down and read everything that people have written about it, I'll, 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 I'll make some kind of, uh, I'll be able to map out really what the story of Scots is. And that might give us some pointers about how we can treat it slightly better, hopefully, in the future. Well, let's do some mapping out of that now ourselves. Um, obviously, at sort of a highlights to our level of the book, but, you know, let's start off. Um, obviously, as you hinted at in that answer, sort of one reason it's so dynamic now is because of how it's been treated in the past. Can you take us through, um, in the book, you outline five stages that have resulted in the repression of Scots? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, I think most uh, most writers, um, you know, point to the loss of political autonomy of Scotland uh, at the very early part of the 18th century. In 1707, there was a union of the Scottish and English uh, parliaments. Um, and although uh, there's a lot of kind of um, Scottish uh, cultural practices, if you like, which are enshrined in that union, including law and religion and education, language just wasn't one of them. And um, so, you, uh, so Scotland had the kind of mis, uh, misfortune of joining England just at the time when the English language was beginning to develop itself or trying to develop itself as, as the global language it has become, yeah? So uh, this was like the early part of the 18th century, uh, 1700s and so on. Um, there was a lot of pressure in England to try to uh, purify the English language, you know, um, that, that uh, they're trying to get rid of all sort of kind of nastiness out of it, make it sort of like a, a high level language suitable for the, you know, for the empire and kings and all that sort of stuff. And of course, Poor old Scots uh, came into that, and it was immediately identified um, before the Union. It had just been a, a normal language, if you like, used by government and so on. Uh, it was identified as this kind of um, uh, substandard or defective tongue, which really people should not speak it. You know, you know what I mean. So, and and of course, when there's this kind of union uh, with um, England and Scotland, it's sort of like the the um, you know the, the the bourgeoisie and the, the the people in power in Scotland they tend to go into England a lot, and they were quite embarrassed about the way they spoke. Yeah, so uh, they had this kind of like um, inferiority complex around the language. So during the uh, so that was the kind of first thing, if you like. Then during the uh, 
um, uh, as the 18th century progressed, um, the upper echelons of Scottish society became anglicised. Now, it wasn't just by chance. They had, you know, people came up from England and uh, uh, in order to teach them how to speak English properly, you know. So um, by the end of the 18th century, uh, the the, uh, the upper levels, uh, so the upper middle class and the um, upper classes were um, pretty much English speakers. Um, whereas the people on the street, if you like, and the people out in the countryside, they were more likely to be uh, uh, Scottish speakers. So so you've got the kind of... Um, the, 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 what happened there is the um, Scots then became a class-based language. Um, so it was kind of the uh, you know working classes, rural classes spoke Scots or fairly pure Scots, and most of the uh, middle classes started moving towards uh, uh, towards uh, uh, English. And the, so, but then the problem for for, for Scots then was that when uh, you think about the end of the eighteenth century, the nineteenth century, the education system started to be, become more developed in Scotland as in everywhere else. Uh, it was the Anglophones, it was the Anglophone middle classes who really uh, led that. And the part of their um, ethos was to, <laughs> to get rid of Scots from the classroom. Uh, it wasn't easy. It took them about 100 years, but they eventually you know, managed to, uh, to, do, to do that. Um, so, um, so, so really, Scots has been pretty much excluded from education. Not completely, but uh, pretty much uh, excluded from education in Scotland until fairly recent times. Um, and there's a, there's a kind of an interesting uh, uh, in the book. I, 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 I make a kind of point here is that in the 19th century, right? It's, you, so Sc- remember, Scots start, Scotland had been started being anglicised now for a century. So there was a kind of uh, what we call uh, nationalist movements across Europe, you know, in the Balkans, Scandinavia, all sorts of places like that, where um, there were uh, real resistance to the the empires uh, 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 and foreign um, rule of the day. Never really happened in Scotland, and uh, it's been a mystery for um, historians. Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? I don't know. It happened. There's, there's economic reasons, but one of the um, one of the reasons, cultural reasons, I say is because um, what happened with these sort of nationalist movements um, is that the intellectuals then kind of found solidarity with the people of the country. You know, the sort of uh, uh, the, 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 there's a turn to, uh, turn to the kind of popular culture. But in Scotland, that was impossible because the intellectuals had already been anglicised. They would speak a different language. So there's no way a popular national movement could ever um, arise in Scotland based on uh, based on that uh, language difference. So um, <laughs> so Scotland kind of remained, if you like, uh, from that really early union. It didn't really have that nationalist, um, or not in the kind of political form anyway, that nationalist um, uh, uh, politicisation of, of, of language. And then then basically you've got in the 20th century, and this is problem really with all minority languages, is you've got the kind of um, broadcast media, essentially, you know, starting with um, printing and then films and radio and TV and now social media. So you've got um, English as this incredibly powerful <laughs> um, uh, global language, which is always going to put pressure on, on, on Scots as well. So uh, where other minority languages have tried to deal with that is they... Um, they, 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 they make sure that the, the, the language, my own language, is taught in schools. You know, so people have that kind of basic knowledge and they build up a kind of pride in the language. In school, and that's not happened, right? For a number of reasons we might talk about it later. Um, so you've always got this kind of pressure uh, to you know move towards uh, more English ways of uh, of of speaking. And and actually, the um, you know on top of that, I, I'm, I probably should mention this as well that. The, the suppression of Scots in schools was quite brutal, actually. Uh, it didn't happen to me, but, uh, I mean, almost anybody who uh, you speak about Scots in education, they were beaten physically for speaking Scots. It's horrific. You know, it's a real shame in Scottish uh, history is that um, people got hit with belts and sticks and stuff like that um, just for speaking Scots in, in the classroom. It's quite, quite a brutal oh. regime. And that's, that's um, left a long shadow of kind of shame which uh, is really quite sad. And, and I think a lot of the, you know, when we, we talk about later about, you know, trying to revitalise Scots, trying to get over that shame is actually quite a hard one. And it goes back generations, you know. Mm, no, very much. And I, I think I'm going to ask you a bit more about that um, as we go. But first, I sort of want to clarify something, because I think some listeners might be going, hang on, I wasn't maybe aware of Scots, perhaps, but Scotland does have another language, um, Gaelic or Gaelic, depending on where you're from. And of course, 
in the last decade or so, maybe two decades, um, there has been sort of more prominence around Gaelic on road signs and skills, things like that. Um, before we go farther into Scots, can you help us understand why there's been less protection and activism around Scots, given that there is sort of almost the example to follow or a parallel issue with Gaelic? Yeah, it's, a, it's interesting because we have this. And this is really, again, another unusual aspect of Scottish linguistic culture is we have these two minority languages. Uh, and uh, I would be wrong to say they're competing, but probably to some extent they, they, they do. Um, I mean, you're absolutely right. In Scotland, there's a kind of broad consensus among politicians and most of the public that uh, Gaelic should be protected as a, as a national uh, language. Uh, I mean, that's quite... I think it's quite a generosity of spirit there, but it's not often extended to uh, Scots. And it's not because people don't want that to happen. Um, they, there's been lots of attitude studies over the last 20 or 30 years, um, including one just last year. And so since showing that people are actually quite, um, Scottish people are quite in favour of building up the status of Scots, revitalising it, if you like, and getting it used more normally in Scottish public and and, and, um, uh, and, and cultural life. But, um, but the, the, the bulk of the funding, and it is the vast bulk of the funding, uh, goes to uh, Gaelic. I mean, the, the differences are quite, uh, I'll not even mention them, they're so embarrassingly different, really. Um, they, um, they, and so, well, I will, I mean, why not? They, <laughs> in Scot, and there's about 60, 60 to 70,000 Gaelic speakers, okay? Uh, now, Gaelic is a language, a Celtic language, which is very, very similar to Irish. Um, and less similar to Welsh and and, and so on, but it's um, it's fairly small number of speakers. And nowadays they are um, mostly in the Western Isles. That's Lewis and Harris and those little islands really off the west coast of Scotland. There's still some people in Skye, another island, but a bit closer to mainland Scotland. I mean, poor Gaelic has suffered terrible, terrible repression. Uh, over the years as well, and, and much the same way as Scots was, and for much of the same reasons, and I think that's why it has kind of retreated. At one time, it's spoken over quite a lot of parts of Scotland, but and over the years, it's been retreated or pushed, if you like, over to the top, you know, the top um, uh, north uh, northwest corner uh, of, of Scotland, um, and um, so uh, so it's really on the, on, the, on the back foot. Um, why is it? Why is it got more support? Well, I think there's a number of reasons. Um, there was never any question that Gaelic was a language, although I say it's very close to Irish. It's always been recognised as a as a distinct language, um, and I think there's been a long history of Gaelic of um, organisation around the language. You know, um, from the nineteenth century onwards. You know, there's sort of like around uh, the Maud, which is a, a musical um, festival, a very big festival, mostly around romantic or, or cultural activities. Uh, they were, the, the, the Gaelic speak has been quite well organised. It's been quite a middle class group who've done that. So when the um, there's a there's an upsurge of political interest started around about the 1950s or 1960s, particularly with Welsh, um, and uh, the this um, the, the Gaelic uh, Gaelic community were well able, if you like, to you know exploit that, if you like. So um, the, the the campaigns for Welsh in the 1960s, maybe into the 70s were quite aggressive and um, the government really had to respond. And, of course, if you respond to one Celtic language, you kind of really have to respond to the other one. Uh, the situation in Ireland and, and Irish is a little bit different. Uh, probably don't have time to go into it today. But, but, um, but basically it was um, the um, um, it was it was almost like they had to do it. You know, if you're going to support Welsh, then you have to support Gaelic. Uh, and there's not really much political cost in supporting Gaelic because, as I say, it's a small, fairly isolated Community, um, you know, there's not going to be upsurge of nationalism caused by um, uh, caused by um, Gaelic. You know, there's no political threat, so it's quite, um, you know, it's a kind of a a fairly easy win really for people to politicians to support uh, Gaelic. Uh, but that's only part of it, and I, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful they're not being unfair with that uh, um, analysis. But I think also there is a kind of template for Gaelic. So if you take what's happened in Scotland with Gaelic and what's happened in Wales, and I think maybe even before that, people say that that was copied from uh, French in, um, in Quebec. The, there's a, this kind of standard template you, you do for language revitalization. You know, so you start with, a, you get a board, you get standardization, you get policies, um, you increase the pr presence of the language in broadcasting and education, and, and so on and so on. So it was quite easy for politicians to do stuff with Gaelic, basically. Uh, when in Scots, for the reason I've just mentioned, there's not really kind of an off-the-peg formula. 
Um, and it's something that we have as Scots people to Scottish people to kind of develop ourselves. And there's really not many places we can look at for a, a model. Um, and I think we've kind of because it's complicated. I think we've kind of lost an opportunity since. Uh, devolution. devolution was the establishment of the Scottish Parliament around about a little over 20 years ago. Um, and I think we've kind of lost that opportunity to really think about Scots and say, well, why is there this disparity between Gaelic and Scotch? You know, why is one treated with much more respect and funding and so on than the other? You know, there's, there's a Gaelic TV channels, there's no Scots TV channels, um, and, and, and so on. So um, I think we kind of lost, uh, lost the opportunity to have that uh, uh, have that debate. I mean, all credit to, the, to our, our, our Gaelic colleagues, though. I mean, I think they, they, as you quite rightly say, they have kind of forged a way forward. And a lot of the issues that they're faced with actually are not that different from Scots, but um, they're far further down the path than Scots is in terms of political organisation. And they, they, they have the funding. And it's a kind of a, it's a virtuous circle. Once you have the funding, then you can organise better. Scots is still in the kind of vicious circle kind of thing. No funding, poorer community organisation and so on. Well, and also one of the things you talk about in the book is that um, if someone used Gaelic on, for example, Twitter or some other sort of social media, um, there might be people going kind of, oh, I don't understand that or wait, why are you making this complicated? But that would probably be the extent to which there'd be some pushback. Whereas you document with when people use Scots in the media or social media, there's a much stronger negative reaction. Why? Yeah, it's quite bizarre, isn't it? Um, I think there's a there's a number of things going on. They're, they're um, and in kind of like social media, like uh, Twitter or whatever it's called now. Um, there's a little bit more tolerance there, but you're quite right. Um, people kind of pick on Scots in a way they don't pick on Gaelic. Gaelic, by the way, there is there are people quite strongly against Gaelic. By the way, uh, I mean I mean there, there there is some commonality there between the two uh, languages, but certainly they come in quite heavily on, on Scots. And I think there is um, there's a number of things. I think one, one is a, there's a kind of class bias. You know that you know what I talked about in, in the history of Scots and about the anglicisation of the upper classes, middle classes. I think Scots is still seen as this dreadful, common low class bad uh, language you know uh, and that sometimes comes through kind of families or whatever but also from school and so it's, it's an easy target if you like um so um and it's often mm, um yeah and it's often make, mixed up with kind of the other big the social um, political divide in scotland is between scottish and uh, british nationalism where um uh, Scottish nationalists tend to no, uh, tend to be more supportive of the, the language, let's say, and uh, British nationalists, which would be like m- the major England-based parties, um, they are pretty ambivalent, at, at least, about any expression of Scottish culture. So when you've got that kind of heady mix of, well, we look down on this language and it's it's representative of Scottish and you know independent culture. Well, I can mock that as much as I want, sort of thing. And actually, there's a kind of a there's a kind of a even even worse. I think so. There's kind of tradition in Scots, but Scots is often used for humour. It's often used in uh, you know humorous song and, and sketches on the TV and uh, the stage. And we think of people like Billy Connolly and and you know people like that. Uh, and that's a great, it's a great asset of Scots. It's a very good vehicle for um, uh, for humour. It's a very, you know, it's an informal language. It's a very familiar language. People feel a lot of re- recognition with it. So it's a great, great uh, vehicle for humour. But there's also this tradition in, 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 in kind of British culture, maybe in all cultures, I suppose, is that making ridiculing working class and rural people, you know, and their culture and the way they speak. So there's a kind of, this all kind of mixes up in a quite a heady, a really unfortunate uh, uh, mix of, of it's obviously kind of quite disdain, sometimes hate. It's quite horrible, actually. Oh. Uh, and that's the worst thing. But I think there's also more generally, it's a kind of unfamiliarity. I mean, um, if you've only been exposed to like odd bits of Scots and comedy stuff on the t- on the television, when people start talking about Scots in a kind of more seriously, serious way, people are just not familiar with it. They say, well, well, what's this all about, you know? And certainly seeing written Scots, um, I don't have time to look at later, there's been a great loss over the last 30 years of literacy in Scots language. So people are not familiar to seeing normal Scots written down in, uh, in, in uh, you know, online or in, in books or anything like that. So... Um, all this thing kind of mixed together and, and they become a quite heady brew. It's quite, when people are sort of like, unfortunately, it's often women, by the way, it's often 
uh, young women who, who there's, there's the um, who when they, they, they speak Scots or they sing in Scots or they you know do poems in Scots, they often get quite targeted by it. I think there's, an, there's something kind of weird going on about that. Um, but um, the um, so it's a mixture of all these things. Uh, but you're quite right. It's also it's like I just say it's like almost like a revolution. It's really weird. Uh, to be honest, and I feel as a society, I feel quite ashamed for it. I think as a society, we should have moved on from that. I think the, the idea of sort of casual discrimination and oh, it's, we should be moved on from that, really. Um, but we haven't, <laughs> not oh, quite yet. Not quite yet. Um, in addition to those divides that you've just sort of sketched for us, you also document in the book that there's very much a divide between sort of normal everyday people and politicians when it comes to sort of how prevalent the Scots language is today, what people want to see with it going forward. Can you sort of take us through what this divide looks like? Yeah, so um, we, we there's not, I mean, there's not a lot of, let's say, research in the way that people use Scots. I mean, a lot of it's based on, you know, just what you hear in the streets. The closest we got to was in 2011. There was a census. We do a census in the UK every 10 years and ask lots of questions <coughs> to do with society. And one was, what languages do you, do you speak? And <coughs> um, there was a really big surprise that the results of that came out in 2013. And there's, there's a population of Scots, Scotland there's a little over 5 million. And about one and a half million, that's a lot of people, said they, uh, they, they spoke Scots. You know, it was quite astonishing it was like a kind of like this expression of scottish cultural autonomy and nobody ever seen this before and and i have to say i think the authorities and the academic academics didn't really know how to respond to it really um but um so there's a lot of scots there in um in scottish vernacular culture you know uh, what that actually means and if i said i spoke scots what does it actually mean well there's a few questions around that but all the kind of census questions are always self-declaration. So if I said I spoke Welsh, nobody's going to say to what level or anything like that. So, um, so there's a lot of Scottish culture uh, uh, out there. And when when um, the public, I think I mentioned earlier, when the public are ever asked, they're not asked very often, what do you think you should do with Scots? And nearly always the, the, the majority answer is we should develop it more. It should be more prominent in education, more prominent uh, broadcasting, and so on. And this has been true of, for, for, for a long time. But politicians have not really picked up on, on that. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, if you listen to the debates in the Scottish Parliament, if you, <laughs> you probably don't want to, but if you did, it's nearly all in English. It's mostly in English. Uh, so it's a very Anglo, Anglo, anglicised um, environment uh, and you've got then the 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 kind of political divide between um scottish nationalists who currently run the parliament and um the uh what sometimes called unionists which are the you know the more british nationalists so in, if you're a if you're in the labor party or the conservative party the liberal democrats or you know one of these uh unions what we call unionist part unionist parties they are going to be um they're going to get they do not going to be supportive of scots positive policies because language is quite an important indicator of uh, national identity oh, everywhere. So they, they see it as a bit of a maybe a threat, so they, they tend not to support it. What's really more interesting is the Scottish National Party, the SNP, uh, who, uh, as I say, currently run the, um, the, the, Scottish, uh, the Scottish government. Um, they were quite enthusiastic in the past, um, uh, but I think when the census results came out in uh, 2013, um, they certainly kind of cooled, I think, <laughs> their support for Scots because that's a lot of people. And if you're going to sort of like support a language for so many people, that costs money, you know. And if you've the model, only model you've got is the one for a Gaelic. I mean, Gaelic speakers get like this equivalent of something like, I'm sure I read it somewhere, about £750 per person support, you know, include all the kind of television channels and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and the equivalent figure for Scots is currently as a, uh, 17 pence, <laughs> less than 20 pence a person. That's how much Scots get supported. Uh, there's a little bit of support for Scots, but it's fairly trivial. Um, so I think there's a, the, the, there's, there's a sudden panic, you know, and they say, well, oh, my goodness, we can't really push Scots because that's going to be a lot of money, and or it could be a lot of money, and that gives ammunition for our, our, our opponents, yeah? Um, uh, and there's a couple of other things as well. The Scottish National Party, for despite its name, uh, it's not really very strong on cultural issues. It tends to steer away from anything that might be uh, accused of being like ethnic nationalism, you know. So, um, and 
in a sense, quite rightly so. But um, you know, language is that has that kind of um, uh, connotation to it. So they tend not to. They tend to be very low key on that sort of stuff. And there's also the potential of Scots um, promotion of Scots being a bit divisive for all the reasons I've mentioned earlier. You know, there's not a huge consensus on it, though people want to support it when it actually comes down to nitty gritty spending it, using it in education. Um, they are fearful of a bit of a backlash. The, the Scottish media is very ambivalent towards Scots as well. We've got a number of newspapers, we've got a branch of the BBC and ITV, uh, independent television. And they're all very ambivalent and sometimes quite negative about uh, Scots. So I think if you're a political party, there is a kind of reasons why you wouldn't support it, to be honest. Um, there, <laughs> there's other things as well, but that's um, that's that, that's the the reason. So politicians, there's big, I think there's a big um, a disjunct, if you like, between what the politicians think and what the public think. So could you do a bit more of that comparison that you did just a little bit there in terms of monetary support? If we think about Scots as a minority language, we can compare it not just to Gaelic or French in Quebec, but also to minority languages within the EU. How does Scots stack up in that comparison? Oh, my goodness. So um, so we've got um, the EU has uh, been very positive about language diversity and support for minority languages for quite a long time, actually. And I think that that stemmed out post-war, you know, human rights um, ideology, um, you know, the dreadful things that happened in the Second World War. I think there was a, a much more focus on people's uh, rights, you know, and, and again, rightly, rightly so, including language. And um, over 20 years ago, the, the UK government signed uh, into an agreement called the European Charter for Regional and Minority Languages. Um, it's a bit of a long title, but that kind of represents the kind of European um, um, ideology isn't quite the right word, but the, 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 the yeah, what they call it ideology on supporting um, minority languages. Yeah, so the UK has signed up for that, and many countries have signed up for that as well. Um, and basically, what that said is that there's a, there should be a right to use a right to use a minority language in public and private life. Okay, an inalienable right. Yeah, that's a great word. Inalienable right for that. You know, um, and also there was need for um, uh, re- resolute action to you know safeguard these uh, threatened tongues. So back then, twenty years ago, there's quite uh, so. So that included sort of um, Gaelic and Irish and um, Welsh, it's two ver- two varieties of Scots, um, uh, Scots in Scotland and and also Scots in in, um, in Ireland. And also, uh, I think I added in Cornish, um, Manx, and was another one. I think well, that, that is, oh, I think maybe was it Channel Islands. I don't know. There, there's actually a number of languages there, but really, that was the sort of UK's um, response to it. But that represented really something that happened right across uh, Europe. My, my most of my experience has been with um, in Catalonia, in Spain. Uh, I've got kind of you know personal. Um, <clears throat> Connections in. I've been going backwards and forwards for uh, <laughs> now on thirty years, and I was there last weekend actually. And so I've kind of watched over those times how Catalan, which is another minority language, uh, certainly post Franco, which is that from the seventies on, uh, late seventies onwards, um, has raised in status from um, you know very much a, um, a repressed language to something which is fairly much uh, fairly you know, accepted now as part of Catalan culture uh, in a process that they call normalisation. Um, and that kind of means that the, the language just has a kind of parity, if you like, with uh, with uh, Castil- Castilian S- Spanish. So if you look at that kind of, you know, so if you think about Scots, uh, the way I look at it, it's like Scots is like one end of the spectrum of really 17 pence of head. And you've got Catalan as <laughs> the other one, which is really a mainstream part of the uh, you know, political, social, cultural environment. You know, they're, they're two very, very different um, ends of the spectrum. And other languages in Spain are somewhere in between there. I mean, it's sort of like uh, I talk in the book about Basque and how they had to create a standard Basque in order to get the various dialects speaking to each other. And uh, I don't think I mentioned the book, but Galician is another one I'm interested in, um, where it's a very low status language that's. Uh, but even that, um, uh, 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 and really under a lot of threat, but even that gets. Loads more support than than, than than Scots does. I remember speaking to a, a, a Galician language activist some years ago, and uh, uh, she was saying that or I, got, I got gathered from her that the support they got in their town in Galicia was more than the whole of Scotland got in terms of money, you know, and and people oh. working on the language. 
quite remarkable. And actually, I, I wonder, actually, is, I mean, I haven't done this work yet, but I will do, I think, is look at you know, the way that uh, dialects and languages are treated. Not in Spain. Spain's a kind of a, 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 um, a particular case study, but maybe places like you know, Italy or, or, or Germany, where um, uh, uh, you know, how these languages are, are, are supported and dialects are supported. I suspect Scots is pretty much at the bottom of the pile, pretty much. We are really very, very bad at this. <laughs> very bad at this. Uh, so, given that deficit, then what? I mean, obviously, saying that like the goal is three years from now to be like Catalan, right? That's obviously not the goal. What would sort of normal look like for Scots today or in the near future? Yeah, I, I think uh, even in, even in, even in Catalan, I think uh, even in Catalonia. Um, the normalization they, they regard as a process. It's never an end point. It's always an aspiration. You know, you're always trying to get there. And as I said earlier um, about these sort of like pressure from these big global languages, and you know, in Scotland it's obviously English, and Catalonia it's, uh, it's Spanish, and the um, it's very it's almost impossible to completely um, balance that. You know, so so the idea is that you have um, the first thing really is to stop. Um, you know, discrimination against speakers. Uh, that, that's really right across Europe. That would be the kind of like the common denominator, really. People should not be discriminated against because of the language or the variety of language or dialect or whatever they, they, they speak. Uh, beyond that, uh, it's the kind of the normal and official use of the language, Scots in this case, um, and, and promote the use of Scots really at all levels of, um, you know, public and, and cultural life on a basis of equality. So, you know, like, it's not like English is the top one, and if you press a button at the bottom, you'll get to Scots or you know Catalan, or whatever it is. Um, that is the kind of kind of aim. So you've got this kind of um, um, a kind of it's, a, it's like a respect agenda. You say, well, it's going to be you know roughly the same. And I think in Catal Catal uh, in Catalonia, that's pretty much achieved. It's not completely there, but it's pretty much achieved. Um, and then the other thing about there is the um, the um, the need to enhance people's uh, kind of literacy, if you like. Um, I remember when it when it first this was like thirty years ago when I started going to Cat Catalonia, I used to get kind of supplements in newspapers saying this is how you speak Catalan, right? That was where it was thirty years ago, and I think we almost need that sort of thing there for the you know, for everyday people saying this is what Scots is, you know, this is how you can this is how you can improve your skills in Scots. We're way way off that, but I do think we need that sort of engagement and increase in people's literacy around uh, uh, around. Um, uh, around the language and I think part of that would be you know you see more regular use in well, obviously in education that's very important um, but uh, everyone should have the right to you know access Scots through that but uh, but you know regular use in public spaces you know signage and you know official transactions government transactions and so on you know plenty of exposure and broadcasts and print and not just simply the kind of comic stuff you know you know, proper proper um, exploration of, of, of Scots and, and probably better uh, my particular peeve is that uh, we don't support Scots particularly well in the uh, in universities either. We don't have much research going on in there as well. But um, the, the, And more support for Scots-based uh, arts and so, that sort of thing. So um, so that's where we're heading for. So not normalisation. So none of those are really saying, like, people will just speak Scots and nothing else. That's not really kind of aim. I, I just to kind of have this kind of, um, um, you know, equality of respect, if you like. And I think that's that's what we're aiming for, really. Uh, the, uh, at this stage anyway. To achieve a number of those goals, especially in education um, and any sort of kind of written down form, it would help and as often as you talk about in the book kind of a key step towards this normalisation is standardising, for example, how things are written down in Scots, which is not nearly as simple to say that as to do in practice. Why is the question of sort of creating a standard Scots so tricky? It's um, it's kind of a weird one, actually. I think the, um, in a sense, because w w when we talk about Scots um, in its kind of slightly more purer form, less mixed up with English, a lot of that derives or is very closely linked to the literary standard from maybe the late 19th, early 20th century. And, and um, certainly there was sort of grammars and so on that were produced. Uh, based on 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 that and and, and field studies uh, and so on, so and, and you know there's dictionaries and and and, um, and that. So in a sort of a sense, 
there was a kind of a literary standard. There is actually kind of a, if you look through the kind of mainstream dictionaries, and there's, there's popular dictionaries and essential dictionaries and stuff like that, there's online dictionaries, they kind of represent that kind of writ, form of written Scots, yeah? Um, and and I think partly people are just simply not aware of it. <laughs> I was going to be able to say, I didn't even know there's a written form of Scots, you know, and I, I spend a lot, probably too much time, on social media sort of trawling through kind of Scots-related stuff, and uh, people don't even know that there is actually ever was, they don't even know there's actually dictionaries of Scots. It's quite, it just goes to show how the education system has really let down this linguistic community, because if you don't even know there's dictionaries in your own language, in a bad state, you know, and 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 uh, so so that, that that's really a, a one problem. Um, I think there is a um, uh, there's a couple of other ones. One is um, the imposition of English uh, in, in schools, as I said, was quite brutal, and I think people fear a kind of prescriptivism, you know, a sort of like harsh prescriptivism. So if I suddenly became the Scots language commissar, I'm not really looking for that job, um, I would then be beating up people if they didn't speak Scots properly. And honestly, and it sounds ridiculous, but honestly, that's what people fear. Um, they think that uh, Scots be imposed in the same way that English was on them. And that's quite a hard thing to, um, that's quite a hard thing to battle against, uh, really. Um, there's also the issue I mentioned earlier about dialects. There's, there's quite a lot of different different Scots. Well, not a lot of them, but there's four or five different Scots dialects. They all have different varieties of Scots, and I think people who are very into their own dialects tend to feel that um, um, a standard Scots might be um, an imposition. You know, um, the there's there's um, the uh, there's also a kind of um, um, a kind of odd thing about uh, Scots as well, and as I said earlier, because Scots has been such an informal spoken language, essentially, it has this kind of rebellious tinge. And if you if you listen, or, sorry, if you read stuff across social media, or poetry, or or anything like that, um, and modern novels, things like uh, Train Spotting and and um, that type of book, it often often uses Scots or Scots linguistic themes um, as a kind of rebellious uh, mode. You know, it's a it's a it's a way of uh, this dem- demonstrating your rejection of <laughs> mainstream society, right? And uh, that is really kind of an, it's an artistic trope, really, rather than a, a popular one. But um, I think then artists often feel that, um, uh, who have quite a lot of status in Scots, by the way, in, in the Scots language community, they, um, they feel, again, that would be stifling their creativity if you had a standard Scots. So my kind of response to that is, is that um, really we're only talking about a kind of formal Scots written Scots. You know, nobody's asking, saying to anyone, you cannot speak your Scots-English mix in this way or your dialect mix. This is something you would use primarily for education, maybe a little bit for broadcasting, um, but really for kind of signage and official official use, that type of stuff. So it's really a written, it's almost like a written, can you imagine, what would mean, a written dialect sort of thing uh, of a language. And I don't know whether that kind of calms people down, but, but people feel very strongly about it. And it's uh, you know, and I think if people feel, well, you're going to interfere the way I speak every day, aren't you a monster? You know, I, I, you, we have to, we always have to, <laughs> in language revitalization, you have to start where people are. Um, and, uh, you, you know, the, I think there's a lot of work needs to be done to kind of calm those kind of fears. I think there's also, uh, there's one other thing about standardization is once you raise, the, if you standardize, you raise the status of Scots, it becomes an equivalent to English. Because it has a standard, you know, and currently it hasn't got a real standard. It's got a partial literary standard, but it's got a real standard, um, and that opens up the opportunity for asking for rights. And I think there's a real kind of fear amongst some politicians that if you have a status for Scots, it means we have to do something about it in the same way as we had to do something about Gaelic in the 80s, 90s, and, and you know, 2000s. It becomes a, a much more um, um, what do you call it? A much more kind of solid language we have to then act with, and and as I say, they, they may fear that we may go down the same path, uh, quite expensive path that the, the support for for Gaelic has had. So, um, yeah, it's quite a lot, <laughs> quite a lot of issues there. No, very much so. Um, given that we sort of discussed quite a number of things that politicians could do, whether or not they will, um, but could do for this. What sorts of things do you think communities or individuals could do to take part in a revitalization of Scots? Yeah. So I, mean, I mentioned earlier, I think, or maybe I didn't mention was that one of the reasons that uh, the politicians tend to have um, kind of ignored the, the kind of popular interest in, uh, in, in Scots is there's not been a lot of kind of public demand 
you know. So, I mean, the, 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 our, um, our Gaelic colleagues are, are quite good at um, lobbying for uh, Gaelic um, in, in um, Parliament and, and, and amongst the public. Um, but uh, Scots has not really had that kind of mechanism for that. So there's not really been um, that kind of um, uh, organised demand. I think I mentioned earlier there was a, it's a bit of a kind of a, a vicious circle because if politicians don't um, provide money for communities to organise, uh, then they can't find a voice. And if they can't find a voice, they can't get any money. You know, that's the way we are really with uh, with Scots. And I think you've also got to bear in mind the... Um, the demographic of Scots speakers, uh, as, as I mentioned, um, the uh, and this has been true really of the last hundred years, really increasingly so. Um, the um, most of the speakers are of working class or rural um, class, you know. So they kind of lack what um, I always think is a bit patronising term, but uh, the cultural capital to organise around their language. Uh, either they still feel that stigma of shame around the language; it's still, you know, still not gone away. Uh, or they don't have you know the time and the the, the skills and, and 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 so on to organise themselves, and and a kind of interesting example of that, or a counter example of that, is in north uh, um, in northeast Scotland and around the Aberdeen area, where there's a dialect of Scots called Doric, the Doric, which is it's a lovely dialect of Scots, and it's uh, in that area there's, there's still quite a lot of Doric speakers. Um, it's not a majority, but quite a lot of Doric speakers. But what's really interesting in that area is that there's quite there's a small group of middle class Doric speakers, and they've been very effective at um, uh, at, motor, uh, at organising themselves around the, the support of Doric, often really much better than the, the mainstream uh, Scottish community. So. Um, there, the, the, there's a kind of we've got a kind of a what's the word? It's like a chicken and egg, really. Um, the communities are not very well organised. So, so in the book, what we're saying is we're really in the in the in the and this is a difficult call actually. In the absence of you know much political support, communities really have to get together, um, and we have to become um, uh, we have to kind of curate our own own, own language. Um, the um, we 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 really it's, it's a kind of a personal responsibility. We have to kind of resist the kind of discrimination and cultivate what, what I call the linguistic loyalty. Find fellow enthusiasts. Um, find out as much as you can about Scots. Look at literary Scots and and see what you can learn from that. Um, of course, you know develop your own dialects and so on alongside that. But um, we, but, but mainly what we, we can do really as individuals just use Scots a lot, you know, as, as much as we can. I mean, as I, as I said earlier, then the, um, the the vernacular in Scotland is this mixture between Scots and English. And if we kind of we can actually push that a little bit more down the Scots uh, down the Scot to the, the Scots end of the spectrum, people really have to use it and really get away from this idea it's shameful to speak Scots. Use the language a lot more, you know, increase the the. Um, uh, you know the, the the number of Scots words and phrases you use, but then you've got to learn a little bit about it. And, and actually, the, the learning materials and so on in Scots is, is not great, to, to, to be honest. So when we come back to that at the very end, um, but um, so there's 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 quite a lot there. I, I think there's a kind of a political thing that we, we need to do um, to get you know sort of find the kind of seed funding for that sort of thing. But ultimately, it's down to the communities. And if the communities don't engage, they don't want to do it. You know, this language will disappear, and that's really. Pretty much it. I mean, Scots in a you know you be if you know about uh, um, minority languages, um, the, the the key element is what's called intergenerational transmission, and uh, what that means is if, if parents don't teach the language, whatever language it is, to their children, that language will die out. Right? And there's a great fear in the Scots community that that is what's happening now. You know, so we need to we don't have a lot of time really to to organise ourselves. So it's really kind of build up your own you know confidence and and, and be more active. Uh, uh, be more active in that um yeah yeah no and obviously books like this are a contribution to that um you've already mentioned uh, little hints throughout i think of kind of this is obviously this book is not the end of your engagement with this so before i let you go um could you tell us a bit about what you are working on now that this book is out yeah yeah so the um the um Unlocking Scots. I mean, it took a while, it took a while to put it together. It was about, about ten years actually. At the end of the day, but it was really desk research because, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I'm I'm sort of based out in London just now, so I didn't really have access to kind of. I mean, apart from online access, I didn't really have access to, um, to to interview people as I, as I really wanted to do initially. So it's based on published uh, material, 
So starting this winter, uh, I'm going to try and reach out more to Scots speakers, activists, teachers, researchers, and so on, uh, and try and get an idea what people um, what people think now. Um, and really, you know, what, 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 how can we find a way a way forward? That was interesting. If you go back 2009, one of the early um, Scottish National Party SNP government. Um, activities was to have an audit of Scots language provision, and, and that was actually quite remarkable. Uh, over f- oh, fourteen years ago now, um, it was. Um, it just showed how much Scots was out there. You know, I think I mentioned that before. There's a lot of Scots out there, but we're not very good at kind of uh, identifying it. So I'd like to do a little bit about that, kind of revisit that type of thing, and see what, how people are using Scots and so on. Uh, get an idea of uh, you know different attitudes, and I think part of the thing I'd like to do, um, maybe I won't be able to do that, is to see if there's a kind of consensus around Scots because. The Scots language um, uh, community, if that's a such a thing, of activists is often portrayed as quite fractious. You know, uh, there's been attempts, for example, uh, in the uh, late 1990s to develop a Scots uh, standard. You know, out of the lingu- you know the literary standard I mentioned earlier, uh, to, to kind of modernise and update it. And I thought it was very excellent, but everyone fell out. <laughs> and that never happened. And that is actually fairly typical, by the way, of uh, minority language communities. That people tend to take things uh, very, very seriously. And um, so, but I'm, I'm kind of wondering whether maybe we can move on from that as well, and we can uh, we can find some kind of consensus, and that might help um, help us kind of develop and, and move forward. Um, I also mentioned I'm an educator, so I'm kind of interested in learning materials. Uh, um, I've, I've, in the past, I've done a you know I've done a grammar of Scots and. Uh, lists of Scots phrases and words. And so uh, over the next year or so, I'm going to read, redevelop and republish that. But also think really how we can use kind of modern, more modern methods, in, you know, not simply grammar book, but, you know, sort of social media, you know, video, maybe even AI, who knows, uh, to try to build this kind of learning community. Maybe maybe the, um, um, you know, if we don't have funding, maybe it's online is maybe the way we, we, we should go. So there's a huge kind of project somewhere in, in there. So, you know, trying to get kind of, an up-to-date view of what you know, speakers and teachers and so on want to think about Scots, how we can bring, build up the kind of materials around that, how we can engage with people. And also, I also mentioned just a little bit how we, what we can learn from other language revitalization. My, As I said, my experience has mostly been with, uh, you know, Catalan, which is kind of like Rolls-Royce, if you like, of language revitalization. <laughs> We've got a Scots bicycle. We're just trying to pedal down the road. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of other places where there's somewhere in between there. You know, as I mentioned, things about, you know, supporting for like German dialects and Italian dialects and uh, smaller languages in Italy and, and, and so on. So, and I'm sure there's a lot we can learn from from those as well. Um, you know, it's not, we, we, I, what I'm saying is we don't need to replicate what's happened with Gaelic or Welsh or, or Irish. Um, we, we we need to find our own path forward, and I think if we can find a consensus of the uh, of, of a route map and a, a, a map for that to take us to the next steps, I think that will be helpful for <laughs> helpful for all of us. I think very much so. Um, lots of exciting thing, exciting things coming up. Thank you for sort of briefly outlining them for us. Um, at the end of the conversation, taking us through your book titled again, Unlocking Scots, The Secret Life of the Scots Language, published by Lewis, as you said, in the summer of 2023. Clive, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Oh, it's been a tremendous uh, pleasure speaking with you. And uh, thanks very much for inviting me. And uh, Hopefully, get maybe get a chance to read the book. It's it's, 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 it's a lot of really interesting. It's a lot of interesting backstory there.